Welcome to the Cabrera Lab podcast. Hey. Hey, how you doing? You having fun? I am having fun. Nice. All the time. It's always fun. Nice. All right, so I was thinking about this. I always have this moment where I'm like, what's the topic? I know. And then you're going to tell me and then... Well, most of the time I'm just spitballing it because there's so many things that we can yeah, talk about. There's a lot. But it seems to me... Here uh, it comes. What? <laughs> <laughs> Drum roll, please. I think we should talk about neurodiversity because we talk a lot about thinking and we talk a lot about how we can get better Whoa. at thinking. This is going to get personal. Well, <laughs> I wasn't going there, but maybe. But I I was just thinking. How are we going to talk about neurodiversity without it getting personal? Well, I know we will get personal yeah. because of your own experiences. But yeah. my hope is that anyone listening out there if they're neurotypical or neurodiverse, is getting something out of what we're talking about because we're really about everybody be getting better every day about whatever they're trying to do yeah. and leveling up their thinking, raising their TQ, all of that. And it occurred to me that maybe there are people out there watching who think maybe it doesn't apply to them because of some reason or the other. But I would like to disabuse them of that idea. I would like you know, people to know that this is all possible for everybody. Yeah, I mean, I would I would go kind of even further and say that like this is as a, as a neurodiverse per I, I don't love the word neurodiverse, but as a person with of neurodiversity descent mm -hmm. or whatever, I don't. Yeah, I don't think I would be alive without it. Yeah, I think I think it would be really helpful for people to understand the relationship between your own struggle with understanding how, you, you know, your own neuro, neurological characteristics or patterns mm -hmm. or whatever, and how that actually was in some ways the impetus for what you, your whole life's work. Yeah. And how, how it has, how it has been connected and, and what you're hoping for. And I think that would be really helpful. Yeah, I and mean, it's hard to know where to start, but I guess like historically, you could just start at the beginning. I mean, that's mostly where most people. Start. Yeah, like, <laughs> you know, I mean, I did terribly in school, mm -hmm. um, just absolutely as bad as you can do. Like, I have report cards that my mother saved that have straight Fs, like F yes. F F F F F. That's actually kind of impressive. I'm a little proud of that. <laughs> Because it's not, it's easy to get like, you know, some people can get C's and D's and an F or two. But I had, I have report cards. Yeah. That all are Fs. literally all F's. I have seen them. That is not easy to do. That is an accomplishment in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And um, so, but at the time it wasn't so funny, right? Yeah. I can, I can say that now in retrospect, but at the time it was, it was horrifying and, and not funny and like very upsetting for my parents and, and, uh, it didn't match with what they saw as potential, right. and um, well, and you weren't trying to get all this. No, I really wasn't. I mean, that's a, that's an important. I, I was like, I, I mean, there's a, that famous cartoon of like, you know, in order to be have equity in our school system, we're going to ask everybody to climb the same tree, except the students. One's a monkey and one's a fish. Right. Right. And so. You know, if you'd asked me to do things uh, that I guess w would be more neurodiverse, I could have done those things very easily. But but I was being asked to do very neurotypical things, and I wasn't good at them. Right. So in that scenario, you're the at, fish. At the time, I had no idea I was a fish. I thought it was right. a monkey, right? right? I mean, that's the part that people have a hard time understanding. So you're sitting there as a fish mm -hmm. thinking you're a monkey and wondering what is wrong with you. Yeah. What the hell is wrong with me? Yeah that I cannot do what other monkeys can do. And then somebody comes along and goes, hey, you know, you're a fish. <laughs> and you're like, oh. Oh, that all makes sense <laughs> That now. whole breathing underwater thing. It would be interesting, I think, for you to describe what you struggled with in the school mm -hmm. environment specifically, even before you knew of, you know, in, in, I know that you, you were diagnosed with certain things in your 20s. And 30s. And yeah. 30s. But I think it, for a lot of people, it would be helpful to sort of have an understanding almost experientially of what it was like. <clears throat> what did you struggle with in the moment, in the classroom, in this neurotypical setting as a neurodiverse person? 
Yeah, so so I think it, I think it it's very difficult because I have so much awareness today mm-hmm. of how my brain works and and what was going on. But you've got to go back and put yourself in a in a context, in a historical context that that one society itself doesn't even know about these things. Like mm-hmm. ADD doesn't exist. Uh, autism doesn't exist. From, from you know, in terms of society knowing about it, when teachers don't young. know about it. Nobody knows about it. When you were young, when I was before young. we had yeah. all of these words, yeah. Um, You're that old. <laughs> no, yeah, I am that old. I'm but just uh, and that includes me. I don't know about it. My parents don't know about it. Yes. Nobody knows about it. No, it's not a thing. Mm-hmm. So what do they know about? They know about you know intelligence, and they know about hard work. Right. So that's how they measure it. You're dumb and you're lazy. Yeah. Because you're not hardworking, otherwise you'd get A's. And you're not smart, otherwise you'd get A's, right? So you're dumb and you're lazy. Mm -hmm. So the entire system on a daily basis in every single interaction taught me over and over and over again that I was dumb and lazy. That's and I was like, oh, I agree. <laughs> I'm dumb and lazy. I must be dumb and lazy. Yeah, but that sets that that sets a whole bunch of stuff in motion, right? How you think about yourself, how you feel about yourself, the choices you see for yourself. Um, you know, just and how other you know how other because how others perceive you impacts how you perceive yourself, right? Yeah, I so. think it maybe did. Yeah. I don't know if it. I don't know if, you know, I mean, it made me who I am, so I'm happy about that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't wish it upon somebody else, I guess. I wouldn't wish it on a kid today. But, um, and I think kids today have, there's more awareness, so that's good. Um, but, but I still think, like, you know, even the fact that it's, you know, to talk about distinctions like ADHD, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, right? Mm-hmm. So you've got deficit and disorder yeah, and hyperactive and then attention, right? So first of all, I don't perceive what the way my brain works, the diversity of my neurological system, I don't perceive it today as a deficit. I perceive it as a tremendous strength. That's good. I don't perceive it as a disorder. So it's really terribly named. It, what it would, you know, I jokingly say that it should be called bo- boredom intolerance disorder, right? Because right. I just have no tolerance for boredom. Right. You know, ADD is really about not having total control over where your attention goes. It's not about having a deficit of attention. Right. In fact, we have what is called hyperfocus. Yes. Hyperfocus, not hypofocus. Hypo is not enough focus. Hyper. We have both. Mm-hmm. We have not enough focus when when we're not interested. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we have an insane I mean, like I know levels that uh, normal people can neurotypical people have a hard time understanding what hyper focus can look like. Yeah. You don't always have control over where your attention goes. So when when a teacher, for example, and I know teachers today know a lot more about this, but in the old days, a teacher would say, you know, you're not paying attention. And. The truth is you were paying attention, just not to them. Right. You're paying attention to something that is incredible. Like there's some of that little white spittle in the side of their lip and you're watching them and you just like, is it going to go up or down? Is it going to end right. up on their bottom lip or on their top lip? And you're just like focused on that thing. Mm-hmm. And you're just, you're just like, wow, this is cool. Or like the sound of water coming out of a faucet or... Right. You know, just amazing things that are happening all around you. You so it's, know. Yeah, it's not that you're not paying attention. It's that you're you're paying attention but not necessarily to what they want you to pay attention to. You're paying attention to something. Which could be mm-hmm. I mean that one way to say it is that you have a deficit of 
attention. Mm -hmm. But another way to say it is that they have a deficit of interestingness. Yes. They are boring. Yeah. And you have an intolerance to boredom. Right. And what they're covering and the way they're covering it is deadly boring. Yeah, it's not capturing your attention. It is not capturing Literally. my attention. Right. And there is all this other stuff going on, social dynamics in the classroom and amazing science things happening all around you mm -hmm. that is so much more interesting. Right. So you are actually paying, you have attention. It's just on something that has captured your attention. Yes. And that's why in school... It was difficult, right? Because school is all about getting you to pay attention to what they want you to pay attention to so that you can take the tests and get the Social scores control and all of that yeah. stuff, right? Which under which makes sense that you would struggle. I mean, because I, you know, let's be fair. I was a monkey. You were a fish. Like yeah. I could climb that tree. You I had no problem monkey. climbing that tree. Yeah. <laughs> so for me, when the first time you showed me that cartoon... I actually started to understand what you were talking about because you, you know, you had always talked about how you struggled with school. Yeah. And to me, that was a foreign concept because I'm a monkey, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm the world is designed for me. Yeah. The world is designed for monkeys to climb trees. I think, and I, I think the most important thing of that of that is where where neurodiversity as a concept comes from, mm -hmm. is the idea that these are just differences; they're yes. not deficits. Yes. These are just differences. They're not disorders. We don't have to be ashamed of these things. Not that I ever was, but 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 we also don't have to. We don't have to. I, oh, actually, I, I should take that back. There was a time where I was, but because I denied it for like fifteen years, you know. And people said to me, "Oh, you're ADD." And I was like, "Oh, that stuff doesn't exist," you know. So, but these things are not deficits they're not disorders they're just differences mm -hmm. and those differences it turns out are really cool they're really cool and it's not just add i mean it's, it's spectrum disorders and uh you know yeah. i mean i have misophonia i've got this weird sound thing but that means i also pick up on interesting other sounds yeah and uh what's interesting is when I first met you, I started to try to understand the whole idea of ADD and, and all these different types of deficits, obviously, because it was relevant. When you first met me, I wore the exact same thing every day. I know. And rocked in chairs. And I, yeah, I would rock a lot more. Than because I you, you couldn't sort of I couldn't sit stabilize. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I would I'd wear the same thing. And even today, I kind of do that. Like, I, I have five of these and yeah. you know and I, and pr people probably think i wear the exact same clothes every day but but it's just that i have multiple of the same thing yeah so i don't have to make choices right about things that i'm not interested in right so then i like i love the granimals oh i love uh, do you remember granimals yes. you know where they would have like this matching like yeah. you just match a tiger with a tiger and yep. then you'd know if things matched you didn't have to think about you didn't it. have to think about it right yeah. they should have adult granimals because then, you know, so I've basically created the, the equivalent yeah. of adult core animals, which is just buy everything in black. Yeah. And then you don't have to, like, black matches with black. Also gray. Yeah. So I occasionally will variation. do gray and yeah. red. Yeah. You, the, you're up to three. I'm up to three colors. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, and everything else I own that has colors because of you. Other yeah. than Hawaiian shirts, which I like. So wives help with that, too. Yeah. Um. Interesting. Well, what I was thinking about was um, this idea of difference versus deficit is really important. Yeah. And it's important both at the individual level and the collective level. Mm -hmm. I do think that people are starting to move um, towards thinking of it as a difference, not a disorder in the collective. Yes. Somewhat, although if you think about the drug prevalence. Yeah. Right. That's about curing. That's right. That's about taking away the symptoms rather than rather than utilizing the symptoms. Right. Yeah. So. So, I mean, the, the notion that we that all we, that all we do is just kind of like slap a drug on it and then and then we can kind of like decrease the symptoms. Yeah. Um, and, and again, I'm not saying 
you know, if people choose to to utilize pharmaceuticals for that reason, like that's their choice. I'm, helpful, I, yeah. I, if it's helpful, then great. Um, my personal choice was that I I use those in order to learn how to not utilize them. So the yeah. first time I took Ritalin was a was an absolutely mind blowing experience. It was so it was, What do you mean? So. This was many years ago. I finally, I finally was open to the possibility that there was even a thing called ADHD, and that maybe I was having it. And mostly, I had that because you know life was so difficult in so many ways. Mm -hmm. In particular, around school. Yeah. Um, that uh, in my thirty late twenties or thirties, um, I. I finally sort of was willing to be like, you know, entertain the possibility that I had this thing, mm -hmm. right? So I got tested. And interestingly enough, one of the ways that they determined at the time the, the whether you had it or not, aside from, you know, tests and things like that, was just like how much damage did, how much historically yeah. damage could you show? Like if you, if you were a person that, you know, was reasonably intelligent, but just got like terrible grades. Or if you're a person, for example, that is a good upstanding citizen, but just has like a crap ton of speeding tickets, <laughs> you know, which I have. Yes, I'm um, aware. Th those are signs. Yeah. And, and, and um, in other words, the outcomes are just as much of an indication as the inputs. Yeah. To, to diagnosing that. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people have the experience, a lot of neurotypical people, especially as, as society gets more complex and faster paced and all this kind of stuff, a lot of neurotypical people have the same experience that ADD people have because it's overwhelming. The information yeah, is overwhelming. A it's a lot. And so we're having kind of filtering problems. We're not filtering. And so they're, they're having sort of that similar thing, which is like, oh, it seems like I can't filter everything. I can't organize right. myself, all this kind of stuff. Well, um, yeah, so like right there. Like you I lost your attention. Lost my attention. We were talking about how you were diagnosed, and you were saying you took some tests, and they looked at the outcomes of oh, your life. Oh, what I was saying is, so a lot of people experience these things, but then the, but they don't have a history of like, you know, like you look back and you have a wake of terrible things that have happened as yeah. a result, like a pattern of bad and unexpected things. And, and so they use that in the diagnosis, right? And yeah. I had that in spades. Yeah. So um, so anyway, I, I got diagnosed and they gave me Ritalin. Mm -hmm. And I'll, ne I'll never forget the day I took Ritalin. I, I took it and it was like, it was like my brain was neurotypical for the first time in my life. So you'd never experienced it before. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I think it was like, it was, uh, it was like the first time in my whole life that I experienced being neurotypical. And what was it like? It was cool. I mean, it was like, it was like I could organize my thoughts. Oh. I could, um, I, I could have like a direction. Like instead of instead of it being like fireworks, it was like a rocket ship. Oh, I like that. Yeah, you know, and fireworks are cool, but yeah. it's like hard to do anything with fireworks. Fireworks are amazing and they're attention grabbing and all that kind of stuff and they're really marvelous. But but like this allowed me to like take all that explosive power and direct it. Mm -hmm. Right. And I just had clarity. And I said to myself at that moment. Um, I want to take this drug so that I can learn what it feels like to be neurotypical and then I can mimic, I can use my neurodivergent brain to mimic what I'm doing. Right. And then I spend the next several years working on that. Working on And eventually yeah. was able to not need the 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 Ritalin because the Ritalin at the same time that it allowed me to see this part of it, it also kind of had a, a dampening effect on me. 
like your personality. Yeah, my personality was kind of my energy and stuff like that. It just didn't, I didn't like it. And I didn't like being, I didn't, I just, I personally didn't, don't like, you know, doing those. Well, you don't even want to take an aspirin. So like, I I get that. There are a lot of people. I don't like like taking anything that I don't have to, you know, so, so I, you know, it's just my choice not to. So I just used it. I literally would use it and I would pay attention as I was using it to figure out, oh, what's, what is my brain doing that's different? Right. And how's it doing it and all that kind of stuff. Right. So you talked about, you just said that, you know, you tried the, you took, you tried Ritalin, you started to understand what it was like to be neurotypical. And then you use that awareness that you gain from those moments to then figure out a way to <laughs> organize, organize y- your own thoughts. And, and that's when you went and started to work on DSRP, the theory. Yeah. yeah. So t- Maybe I think it would be really interesting for people to know how, how does that how does DSRP connect <laughs> to sort of solving that problem? Do you do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I mean, one of the things that is so powerful about neuro- neurodivergent people, mm-hmm. uh, uh, especially like high functioning neurodivergence, um, is they have amazing brains. They have these brains that are super fast. You know, like they're like race cars of brains and they can go they can go very fast and and they can do a lot of things. And um I don't know if I should tell this story because it takes a little while, but I um <laughs> to me this story is it was when I f- understood everything uh about like historically and about and about my own neurodivergence mm-hmm. all at once. And I was in, um, what's the floaty city? Uh, Venice. Venice. I was yeah. in Venice. And I would get up really early and I, w- and I would just walk around Venice. And then there was nobody around. It was great. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've always liked that. And so, and Venice obviously has, you know, essentially streets, which are water. Right. Right. And so I'm sitting there early morning in the lights, the beautiful light. And, th- and there's all these water channels. And then there's these beautiful bridges that you can, that people can walk over. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm looking at the water and the lights hitting it at a weird angle and, and all this kind of stuff. And, and it's, uh, and the water is of course full of gasoline and, you know, cause there's boats and yeah, taxis and all stuff. kinds of stuff. Right. There's a whole city. Yeah. So it's got all this film on top of it that's kind of looks like gasoline kind of film, yeah. right? Shiny with the colors and all yeah, that. Actually. And I was thinking about like, well, what if you lit a match and it would like <laughs> like oh. that on the top of the water? And I thought that's almost like a neuron, mm. you know, where where when you you know here's two pieces of land and like to connect them you would create like a a, a match and yeah. it would. This is how. I think. Well, you're literally like burning a pathway. Yeah, you're burning saying. a yeah. pathway, yeah. right? It yeah. would like light up electrochemically, right? Yeah. And that would be like a bridge because that's the neuron is like a bridge. So there's a. There, I was literally sitting there looking at the water, looking at a bridge. And I thought to myself, isn't that interesting? Because it's almost like, in my brain, and I think other neurodivergent brains. You don't always have the right amount of gasoline or chemicals in the channel to make the bridge. I see. So what you have to do is you have to run down. If you want to get from point A to B, right? And this is what school was all. If you want to get from point A to B, most neurotypical people will be like, well, that's easy. Let's go as the crow flies. Yeah. But to an ADD person, you're like, I can't. There's no chemicals there for me. I see. I can't cross here. Right. So then what you do is you go all you go a mile downstream, you find a bridge, you cross the bridge, and then you run a mile back. Well, this person just ran 10 yards. Mm-hmm. You ran two miles. Right. And then they call you slow. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> it's terrible. But here's the thing. Mm-hmm. You feel slow at the time because you're like, yeah, that did take me. And then, yeah, that was kind of a stupid way to go. And I could have just done yeah. that. Right. But here's the thing. When you're constantly doing that, you get pretty good VO2 max. Yeah. <laughs> you get yeah. pretty good cardio, right? Right. And you get really good at lo- running long distance. And the network of neurons in your brain gets interconnected because you're running, you're connecting them as you're running the streets. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
And every short path, you're running much further to get there. And pretty soon, you're actually so much faster. Mm -hmm. You're slow in the beginning, but over time, you have a much more interconnected network. network. Mm -hmm. And and on top of that, you have really good cardio, neurological cardio. Yeah. And your network is getting more interconnected. And so you just you you're fast and you can think very well right yeah well and you also would imagine see more and more connections than yeah most you see more connections because you're traveling I, more space yeah i mean that's one of the difference i think about between you and me like one thing i think is really different about you is you'll see 10 connections immediately and i'll i'll see a handful and then need to be sort of working my way out yeah. like you see everything all at once all at lot. once Right, which is yeah. why people talk about this information sensory overload. Right, because you literally see it all. But it's also how it makes it very difficult to communicate. Right, right, and 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 neurodivergent people have trouble. Like they're they're not having trouble having great thoughts a lot of times. Mm -hmm. They're having trouble, kind of organizing those thoughts, clarifying them, and then communicating them. Right, yeah. because because a lot of times they're happening like this. They're happening all at once, mm -hmm. and then they have to they have to take this nonlinear explosion of explosions and explain it to somebody in this linear way that the words come out of your mouth to a person who probably only sees 20% of what you're describing yeah. and sees it in a very linear way. Yes. Right? That's right. When I had this understanding in Venice, it really clicked of how the mind, how my mind was working and having that distinction of the difference made it just very clear then i could see oh okay so i have to explain it in this way i have to do things in a different way to communicate better i have to conceptualize in a different way to get it to be clear enough to get it to be communicated and that got into how information is organized i see and that led to dsrp um and and really figuring out dsrp yeah, so in a way, in a way, this understanding of the difference between, because of the experience with the riddle, and you could actually see the difference between neurotypical and neurodivergent. Yes. And then it allowed you to see the scaffolds that you needed to build. Yes. For your for your own self to be able to manage in in this neurotypical setting. Not not that you were trying to do it because you wanted to manage the neurotypical state. It's because you wanted to mitigate the effect that you were experiencing being- I in, wanted to survive. You wanted to, to survive in a world honest. that was calling you dumb and lazy or- Or just a world that was very confusing, like yes. socially confusing, yes. like, you know, uh, just confusing. It's a confusing world for neurodivergent people. The social, you wanna be social, mm -hmm. but you don't, you don't understand why the rules are a certain way. Mm -hmm. Right. So then you come off as being like too aggressive or too blunt, blunt or blunt too literal to me. Like I have emotion and I have thinking and they're I I very rarely get them confused. Yeah. And I think neurotypical people, they they don't distinguish a lot of times between no, we their conflate them a lot. emotions and their thinking because that's what's normative. Yeah, that's why to me, they're they're just right. Remarkably separate. It, it's not that I don't feel emotion. I, I feel yeah. plenty of emotion. Uh, but but to me, I don't. They're not confused. They're not conflated. Right. So right. that it's very obvious to me when somebody's having an emotion versus a thought. Yes. Uh, and you'll respond to the. And I'll respond to either one. Yeah. But what they do is they try to make they dress up emotions in thought clothing, <laughs> and then they dress up thoughts in emotional clothing. Yeah. And then and, and they try to present them as emotions, and then you're supposed to treat them like emotions, but really they're thoughts. Right. That are just like, hey, I'm an emotion. Look at me. But that's funny because <laughs> I mean, I'm sure we'll have many more conversations about these things, but the the literality. Just just if you imagine, just imagine, I'm saying to this to the audience, imagine you go to a dinner party and there's 10 people there <laughs> and there's one person who is literal, yeah. right? They, that they have no ability to do anything but literal. That person is going to seem completely different, yes. somewhat blunt, yes. uh, and 
and not quite fit in with the group, right? Yeah. Because that person sees everything and sees it differently. Yeah, like if that, if you ask that person, like, do you like my green sweater? And they're like, no. Because they don't. Because you ask them the question, do you like my green sweater? Yeah. So to that question, I wouldn't think anything other than, do I like the green sweater? I wouldn't think somebody's going to get emotionally upset over me if, not, liking, me not their liking their green sweater. Yeah. I would just think they ask me the question. They want to know whether I like this green sweater. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say, no, I think, you know. It's a terrible sweater. It's a terrible sweater. Or I, Actually, I wouldn't even would say, say that. Say, I would just say I don't like the sweater. Or you just say maybe not particularly. Or something. Well, now I would say something different because yeah. I now I now understand that people, you know, yeah. that I, you know, but generally speaking, there's a, a secondary effect, which is, yeah, sure. Now I understand social situations much better than I used to, and and I can handle them and all that. But I don't enjoy them. I I I, I mostly am I uncomfortable. It's not even that I'm uncomfortable a- anymore. It's just that I'm I'm now I'm, I just I'm like this is not relaxing. This is right. this is like a weird chess game where we. Yeah. Pretend to like chess or something like that. But I would also imagine for for people like you having to run two miles to everybody else's 10 yards for Mm -hmm. your whole life makes it it's exhausting. Like I would imagine there's like I would almost imagine there's many acrobats in your head. Right. And they're constantly doing things to to keep up to keep up. Not literally, but, you know, you're constantly doing more to travel the same ways that people get there much, much differently or much faster, linearly. And so I would imagine that social situations have a lot of complexity, which would require a lot of that kind of, I don't know, the only word I can think about is like acrobatics. Like, yeah, I mean, the, the thing that I would say about that, though, is again, it's, it's like, we can frame it that way. And that's typically how we would frame it, mm-hmm. is that I'm just doing so much more work. And that yeah. seems like a negative and these people are just doing this but you know i used to guide in yellowstone national park mm-hmm. and you know 22 day courses and stuff like that and and uh the, the crazy thing about yellowstone is that, you know there's like a couple entrances and then there's a circle of road yeah. right and 99 i don't know you can call the park service but probably 99.8 percent of the visitors to yellowstone Stay on that circle of road. Oh, the whole time they're there. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, like, they, they don't stray they don't very deviate. far, right? Yeah. Well, there's a huge park that surrounds the roads. Mm-hmm. Nobody goes into that park. They just stay on the, on the roads. Why? Because that's what neurotypical visitors do. Yeah, they stay on the path. That's what typical visitors do. So the small number of people who go into the backcountry get to see the absolute grandeur and amazingness of of, of what Yellowstone really is, mm-hmm. right? And I see that as being a metaphor for the brain and for for you know reality. Is like you didn't get to go all the way down here and cross this bridge. Yeah, you didn't get to see all the things that I got to see. Right. Right. So to me, that's why it's not a deficit. Right. It's not I'm not saying if if you want to get from point A to point B, there's your guy. D- don't pick a, a neurotyp right. a neurodiverse person to get you from point A to point B. Right. You know, known quantities, linear, no. But if you want to know you know what's going on mm-hmm. in the network of <laughs> of of streets yeah. and and possibilities. You, and possibilities. Yeah. I've run. I've been running those. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I can run them so, so fast. You know them all. And I know them all. I yeah. know. All, you know because I've. In order to get from A to B, I have to run to a totally different neighborhood. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? So I now I know that neighborhood, and I know this other name. And this place has great tacos. And this place, not that they have tacos in Venice, but. They'd be good, yeah, they, no matter where. You know, th- this one has really good, you know, whatever. And this, yeah. it, and it, and it's like, you know the city. Well, the city's your brain. 
Right, and you know the pathways. And I know the pathways. Because you've walked them so many I've, times. Because I've walked them and I've run them. And I think that's what neurodivergence a lot of times is, is that they've, they, 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 first of all, they've traveled a lot further. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they seem slow, but it's because they came a longer distance. Right. And they benefit from the, from the vistas and the experience of, the, of that distance. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they make more connections. They also aren't filtering as much, right? So, yeah, so, they're taking everything in. Yeah, they're, a lot of times they're taking in a lot more information, which is why it's hard sometimes to deal with all that information and communicate it through this little pipe that we have. Right. Because this is a very linear pipe, right? And same with writing. Like, that's why we're, we tend to be very visual, right? Mm -hmm. Writing and reading is, is very linear. You can only yeah. get what's on the line and the sentence. Yeah. But a visual... You can take it all in. Poof. No, I, I get that because I'm the exact opposite. Yeah. Like, you know, I like to read stuff. No. It takes me a lot longer, as you know, to, to read, you know, like yeah. I'll read a... Yeah. But I can also read the headers of a book and and pretty much understand the book. Yeah. I want to get back to one thing that I thought would be really important for people to mm -hmm. hear. And I would imagine they might be wondering it because you so, you said it, but you didn't really elaborate on it. You were talking about needing to find a way or a thing to help you organize yourself, your brain, mm -hmm. your thoughts. And then you, you said that's what led to DSRP theory. So yeah. I wonder in our last few minutes, and this might be a hard question to answer, I don't know, maybe talk about how DSRP, the theory, um, that's sort of solved that problem for you. How to, you were saying it helped you sort of organize and understand your thoughts. So how does DSR, I just, I think people will wonder about that connection. I mean, basically what it did was it gave me, it gave me a, a model and a language mm -hmm. to understand differences across many spaces, right? So, so, you know, when you're, when you're dabbling in so many different worlds in order to connect the the thing that you're trying to connect which a lot of neurodivergent people are doing right they're they're you know they're interested in everything and that and 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 trying to bring it together in unique ways that people haven't brought it together before and things like that right mm -hmm. well just take two fields any two fields well that each of these let's say quilting and skateboarding yeah you know well, these fields are so different. They have their own language. They have their own nomenclature. They have their own motivations. They have their own interests. They have their own history. They have, you know, everything, right? Right. And, and, uh, and like, if you're trying to bring together quilting and, and, and skateboarding and understand how they're similar and how they're different, right? Mm-hmm. None of the words are going to be the same. None of the history is going to be the same. None of the superficial information is going to be the same. That's what's going to be different. Right. But the underlying structure is the same. And so you can make connections at the underlying structure level. Right? You mm -hmm. can't make connections between Tony Hawk and, you know, a log cabin print. Right. Right. Right? But... But you can make connections at a at a at a structural level. Okay, you mean the right? underlying structure of each. Yes. Okay. Right, and so and that they that they share a similar structure that th this is making distinctions that are important to skateboarders, and this is making distinctions that are important to quilters about right. stitches and types of stitches and things like that. And this is about uh, you know trucks and types of trucks and right. or trucks are the not trucks like a. You mean like the wheel thing? The, the metal that skateboard. the metal that connects yeah. the, the axle yeah. that connects the the, the um, skateboard the wheels and the wheels yeah yeah and to the skateboard yeah so you know there there are structures that are similar so what what you want to understand is how are these different areas organized so that I can deal with them very quickly I can understand them very quickly I can organize them very quickly and I can meld or unmeld them very quickly right right because i'm i'm because because again at the superficial level mm -hmm. i mean think of it let me give you a different example what if you made the assumption that 
the only people that were similar to each other were people that were named the same thing. Yeah, so like all the Georges in the world. All the Georges have, have something in sim similar. Yeah. But a George never has a similarity with a Bob. Yeah, that would be weird. Well, that's how we kind of treat knowledge. Yes. Right? It's like, well, this is, this is a, a skateboarding term and this is a quilting term and there's no... There's no, those are just different. And there's no possibility for something. And there's no possibility to learn right. something about skateboarding from quilting or something about quilting from skateboarding. Interesting. If you understand that those are just superficial details, surface level details, and you understand the underlying structure and patterns mm -hmm. that they share, then a relationship over here that is important in skateboarding, you could, you could, take that importance and that structure and say, oh, is there anything over here in quilting that's like that, that people haven't related yet? And then you can make that relationship and then you can be the innovator of that relationship that yes. hasn't been made in quilting. Right. Or vice versa, that's been made in quilting, but not in skateboarding. Right. And in your person example, if you look at all the Georges as the same, but then you also see a bunch of Bobs. The truth is George and Bob both are made up of DNA. Yeah. They exactly. both have DNA. They both have underlying Underlying, structure. they have the same yes. sort of DNA structures. Yes. yes. And so what you're saying is underneath different bodies of knowledge or mm -hmm. artifacts of knowledge or however you want to say it, you started to see those similar structures underneath. Yeah, and one of those Georges might be more like one of those Bobs than any two Bobs. In structure. <laughs> in, 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 in underlying structure. But you wouldn't know it if but you, you wouldn't know it if you're surface. just focused on what are their names. Right. Right? And I think mostly we focus on what are the names of things. What are Absolutely. the you know, what are the words we use to yeah, describe yeah. things? Right. And that's not where the real meaning is. The real meaning is in the organization. Meaning or mental models is made up of information, which is the, you know, for lack of a better term, the names. Right. And the way that information is organized. Well, that right. organization is is hugely important. And so yeah. DSRP was just what I discovered when I when I searched for, for that. the underlying organization of things. So was there a moment where you started to realize that all of these bodies of knowledge were organized the same way. They had distinction. They were there were crucial distinctions. There were relationships. Mm -hmm. Things were organized into systems and perspectives and all of that. When was the moment where? I mean, this is interesting because not many people have thought this. That you took it from well, this is how things in the world are organized, which means how did you get to the leap that that means that the way that I'm thinking about to create these things is the same structure. Like, how did you see that symmetry? Yeah, so, well, so in classic ADD style, I'm gonna go with what what this reminded me of. Uh, so, so um, I, I, there was a moment, actually, this is before I had discovered DSRP, uh, where I was, I was having these uh, dreams, mm -hmm. like they're they're, um, I forget what you call them, uh, lucid, lucid dreams, lucid dreams. So you're having dreams that you're kind of in control yeah. of. And I was having these dreams that were just. In, I have dreams. I don't have dreams a lot, but I, when I do, they're repetitive, and and I have a little bit of control over where they go, and they just repeat. And it's usually when I'm trying to solve something, and and so I uh, had a, a lucid dream that was just like. All, all things are connected. Well, what are they connected by? All things are connected, but what are they connected by? <laughs> it's right, just like right. Kind of maddening. That's a lot. So anyway, I'm in, I'm 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 walking in in Boston. I'm walking past a store in uh, in uh, Harvard Square, and it's a bookstore. Mm -hmm. And there's a book, and I it catches my eye, and it's sitting right like center center of the whole window, and and it says consilience. Now, at this moment in time, I'm a high school dropout. Yes. I'm a high school dropout who's attempted four times to do college and failed. Yes. But I'm a voracious reader and experiencer and, you know, all that kind of stuff, just like many neurodivergent people are. Yeah. I see this book and I just see this word that I'm unfamiliar with, consilience. And 
underneath it catches my eye the unity of all knowledge and i'm like that's what i'm more i'm working on that yeah i was shocked to see that a book would be written about that yeah because that's what i was working on yeah and i so i go inside and look at the book and i look I immediately turn it over to see who wrote it mm -hmm. and it says this guy didn't even have a name he he was named after letters e o wilson yeah <laughs> I have no idea who he is. Yeah. But it says right there who he is. It's got a picture. It says, uh, widely acclaimed as the world's greatest living scientist. Nice. And blah, blah, blah. E.O. Wilson started, you know, all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wait a minute. So I'm a high school dropout. And I'm thinking about the same thing as the world's greatest living scientist. Wow. Why would that be? It's a moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it suddenly gave what I was thinking about legitimacy. Mm -hmm. And then I immediately thought, oh, I don't have to do it anymore. <laughs> because he's already figured it out. Oh. So I'll just read his book. So I literally didn't, I, di I canceled my day. I bought the book and almost got killed walking home to yeah. my closet. I lived in the closet. Part of the problem. And uh, I read the, uh, was reading the book. I read it cover to cover. And I have to say, I mean, I love E.O. Wilson. Now now I know who E.O. Wilson is. He, I love him. He's amazing. He did amazing. He studied ants and, uh, you know, just an absolute, truly one of the great scientists. Mm -hmm. But it was a terrible book. How so? It was like, it was like so dated. It was it was it was like reading, you know, something out of the Greeks or something like that. It was it was like not part of this century. It, mm -hmm. it was like trying to trying to uh, come at all of knowledge from a thousand years ago. It just felt old fat. It felt like a clunky old model. So then what did you do? Well, then I immediately thought, are you joking? Is this really this is this is what we're this is how we're going to answer this question. Right. There's a better answer to this question. So then I got excited and then I dropped out and then, then went did. to Colorado to be with uh, near near my old climbing partner who who would uh, keep, you know, you in reality. keep me in reality because I knew I was going to go deep into so it. That was it the moment. Three years of, of, of stuff. That was the moment where you decided to answer that question. Yeah. How is all then I knew. knowledge? Then I knew because... Because at that moment, I knew that it was an important question. I didn't know that before. I just thought it was a question that, like, my yeah. silly mind was interested in. Right. But then I was like, oh, my God, like, this is an important question because this guy's asking it. That's funny. And, and, but his answer is not up to snuff. So, so, you, so you set out to now I have Now I have an opportunity. And, and then my attention was just grabbed forever. And that's how you got to... Fast forward back, that's how you got to looking at the underlying structure of knowledge because of the connection to how is all knowledge the same? How is it unified? Like yeah. what are the things that underneath? This gets a little technical, but but if, if you understand, <laughs> so imagine I had this idea this question that kept coming to me, and this happened in a dream also, which was, how do we know about ancient Egyptians? Mm. I thought that was an interesting question. Yeah. We know everything we know about ancient Egyptians, not Egyptians, ancient Egyptians. Mm -hmm. Everything we know about ancient Egyptians, we know from one thing. What they left behind. Artifacts. Yeah. Yeah. What they left behind. The stuff they left Stuff behind. they left behind. Okay. Right? Yeah. So, like, I used to wake up in California and go out in the lawn and, and there'd be those snail tracks. Yeah. You know, those little, the, they yeah. look like little snot trails. <laughs> and so, you know, like, I never saw a snail. <laughs> but you knew but they I saw were there. The, I knew they were there. Yeah. Right? Because you saw evidence. Because I saw a little snot trail. <laughs> and. Uh, I'm sure that has a technique. Yeah, I'm sure it does. <laughs> And um, so everything we know about Egyptians is from what they left behind. Interesting. So at the time, I was, I was again, I was dropout. 
I had no resources, nothing, but I wanted to understand and study this stuff. And I, I thought like, well, I don't have access to MRIs and MRIs were pretty new. And, you know, we, they were, they really just told us where things were happening, not what was happening and, and stuff like that. And, and so I wanted to understand the mind and how it worked. And, um, but, but I was studying knowledge. Mm -hmm. Well, what is knowledge? Knowledge is what the human mind over time has left behind. And it doesn't necessarily have to be physical stuff. Yeah. It can be Yeah, both. it could be knowledge of how to build a table yeah. or knowledge of how to make a waterfall yeah. or knowledge of how to make a pyramid or whatever. So that's what... Or papyrus. Right. Knowledge is what we've left behind. Knowledge is what human minds have left behind. So it tells you... But, but the other thing is knowledge is what human minds have left behind upon attempting to understand the world reality so yeah. knowledge is actually the thing the left behinds the lead behinds of this interaction between human minds and reality over time and i don't think people thought about it that way no at that point if we could understand the underlying structure of knowledge there's there's a good chance that that would reflect on both sides of that equation, on both sides of that relationship, on the way that the mind works and also on the way that the universe works. Because you have incredible statistical properties in this knowledge, right? Which is like, this is a lot of human minds over human right. time. Which means if you're understanding all, if you're understanding what knowledge is by looking at- The underlying patterns The underlying of patterns of knowledge. What you're saying is then there was a corollary thought from that, which is, well, if there's an underlying pattern to the outcomes or the out. So the, there's, so there's a, a relationship the between inputs. the human mind and reality, and yes. that is knowledge. Yes. Knowledge is the leave behind. Knowledge is what the, the human mind poops out mm -hmm. when it interacts with reality. So knowledge is the leftover of, of human minds collectively. Huge, a huge yes. number of human minds studying a huge number of things about the real world leave behind collectively knowledge. Yes. So if we study the structure of that knowledge, not the Bob and John details of the knowledge, but the underlying structure of that knowledge. Right. Then we are simultaneously studying these two things. Yes, reality right. and and the, the mind, the mind, right? And so that was the that was the the hypothesis at least. And so I found the underlying patterns of this yeah. thing, knowledge of D and S and R and P. And then later, we empirically tested whether or not those things were in the mind and in reality, and we found that they they were right universally in the mind and in reality. Like they're they're never not in the mind and in reality. Right, and it's funny to me that you just say that as a sentence. Why? It's kind of a big deal. It's kind of a big deal that you had that thought, right? And and you're like, oh, and then we figured out the underlying patterns of knowledge and the underlying patterns of thinking, and you just say it like it's a sentence, but it's not just a sentence. It's if you if you go all the way back to the struggle that mm -hmm. you started with, it's amazing. It's amazing because it's the thing that helped you understand your own mind yeah. so that you could cope and understand how you were thinking about things to then harness the power of your, of your you know, it's metacognition. Yeah, it kind of it made life possible for me personally. Yeah. But that's not why I did it. That was just kind of a side effect. Yeah, it's a good side effect, though. Yeah. It's a huge side effect. And I guess what's important in in my estimation is the power or the liberation that you might have felt once you understood that. Once you understood... The patterns? Yeah, the patterns. How, how, what was that effect for you? Yeah, that that's interesting. So the the effect that it had on me was was that it made things just so much easier to under to comprehend and clarify and communicate. Right. It did also kind of, and this is a little separate. It came with a heavy burden, which is that I then had to spend my life dealing with this thing that I found. Right. Which is that like, oh, that's not an insignificant thing. I have to tell the world about it, mm -hmm. and I have to 
do things to prove that A, it's empirically true, and B, make it accessible so that people can understand it. And, and you know, that's been a burden that's taken years off my life, uh, you know, uh, that that I don't think is a burden for everybody that learns it because they don't have to. They don't have to go through the process to find it like you did. And they don't have to feel responsible for it. Yeah. I would love to not feel responsible for it. Yeah. I pretty much can't stand it. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's not that I can't stand it. I, just, I, you know, I would like to not feel responsible for it. For bringing it out into the world. Yeah. It would be yeah. great to be like, I'm done. Well. Somebody else can shoulder that. But here's the good news. You are not solely responsible. No, not anymore. You, anymore. When you came, no. it was a big shift. Yeah, I mean, you are you are in a sense responsible for its discovery, which mm -hmm. is a wonderful thing. So there's a quote that I think is misattributed to Gandhi, which is um, first they'll ignore you, then they'll laugh at you, then, then they'll fight you, and then you win or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I think you know, anytime you discover something new that that goes against the dominant norm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the first thing they do is ignore you, mm -hmm. and that's hard. And then, then they laugh at you. And there's a number of years where they laugh at you. And then they bring out the big guns and fight you. And then you know that that's and then you and then you win. And then they you know right. I've seen all those stages, and they, they're yeah. But but they're the all point of all of it in their own way. That means it's becoming a, a point of focus, a point yeah, of interest, sure. a point of curiosity, which is what you want it to be. Yeah. You want it to be something that I think he missed one, which was then they say they knew it all along. <laughs> 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 right. But I think just as a as a callback, yeah. because I, I like to do that. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a personality disorder on my part. You know, we started this whole conversation around around neurodiverse and neurotypical people. Yeah. Yeah, we kind of and, we kind of went off track. Because you're because of you. <laughs> no, funny. just no, we didn't actually have a track. But by, that's, I guess that's sort of funny what I if wanna, you think about it. What I think is interesting through your story is that these patterns of thinking are the patterns of thinking whether you are neurotypical or neurodiverse, meaning they have power to liberate people through metacognition. Yeah. Regardless of where they land on that continuum. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so what's nice is, and I appreciate you sharing your own story, that this really helped you gain that clarity, ability to communicate and actually bring these yeah, ideas I would, out. I would, I would go further and say, I mean, it didn't help me. It was like, it, it, I wouldn't have been able to yeah. even make it. Well, you'd be in jail for too many speeding. I'd be in jail or dead or, <laughs> you know, I just, I, I just was too, I had too many things going on in my brain and not enough control and organization of those things, mm -hmm. purposeful metacognitive. Yeah. That. You know, my body just became like a like a vehicle for expressing the chaos yeah. in my brain. Yeah, that's a good word. And so I would just get in trouble and I'd mm -hmm. do stupid stuff and like mm -hmm. a lot of dangerous stuff. and Because and you needed a lot of stimulation. Yeah. A lot of stimulation. A lot. Yeah. And so this just like, it just made things a little more like, a little less on the edge of chaos and more ordered and complex, right? Manageable. Yeah, manageable. Yeah. Complex, but not like yeah. not full blown stochastic. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a nerdy way to end <laughs> on stochastic. <laughs> Let's all go look up stochastic. It just means like random. I know, right? I know, yeah. but still. Yeah. All right, well, this has been a fascinating conversation. I'm sure it is one of many because mm. I think this is a really interesting thing to think about. Yeah. Um so with I'm that, not sure we really hit on neurodivergence very much. Well, we did. I guess experientially. We, we did. did. <laughs> and and now people will know the backstory, and uh, then we'll keep talking about it in future episodes. Okay. All right, so that's a wrap. And remember to like and subscribe. Mm -hmm.